So I'm going to start my uh, lecture from this title, CRISPR-Cas, a magic tool for crop, crop, in, crop improvement. This was a, this a very burning topic, as you know, and it won a 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to these uh, two young women scientists, uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. One is from France, another is from US. So, I will divide my lecture into three parts. Uh, the first part will deal about the basic idea about uh, DNA and gene expression. Then we have to delve a little bit about the historical development of CRISPR-Cas to understand it better, that how it developed into a genetic gene editing tool. Then I will go for the application part. I will try to brief it as far as possible since time is limiting. So the first part, as you know that the cells are made up of uh, our bodies, every organism's bodies are made of cells, and cells contain, they may contain nucleus or they may not contain, if they are prokaryotic, they will not be containing nuclei. But each of these cells have the chromosomes, and they, the chromosomes contain the DNA, the DNA contains the gene. This part is, I'm doing this basic part just for those people who are not from biology background. The genes are the small segments of uh, DNA. They are not the entire DNA that is present in the chromosome. They're only small portions of, uh, of the genome. You can imagine that human genome has only 3% of, of total genome is gene, less than 3% even. So these areas of DNA, they have a meaning. They actually are responsible for the synthesis of uh, proteins. And they determine our character. So you can imagine that genes are the uh, hereditary units in, in simple words. So when uh, uh, suppose, uh, this picture, the genes are made up of, of the four letters, uh, the nitrogenous bases, A, T, G, C, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymidine, and different type of uh, sequences might be present. So this is double-stranded DNA, the black color. And you know that uh, T comes against A, and C comes against G. A versus T, G versus C, this is the complementarity. This way the double stranded DNA is uh, hybridized or present in a helical manner in our cells. When RNA is synthesized from DNA, uh, it uses one of the strand as template uh, and the other strand is the R template. If you see that the template, uh, the sequence of the RNA is same as that of the sequence of the R template strand, strand uh, only the T will be replaced by U in case of RNA. Otherwise, everything will be same. A, C, G, C, C. In place of T, it will be U, G, G, A, A, C, C, like this. So the RNA, in the next slide, we will understand that why I'm telling this. The information considered in the DNA in the form of genes are transferred finally to the proteins via RNA and these proteins are our final expression uh, by which we get our characters, different kinds of characters that we, you can see of an organism is because of the proteins. The sequence of amino acids in the protein, uh, proteins are determined by the sequence of uh, ribonucleotides in the RNA and deoxyribonucleotides in the DNA. So for each of the amino acids in the protein, there are three nucleotides designated for that, for each of the amino acids. So if a protein is made up of, say, 50 amino acids, there will be 150 nucleotides for that in the RNA, and there will be 150 deoxyribonucleotides in the DNA. So this is the codon dictionary scientists have deciphered that which particular genetic code, these are called genetic code, these triplet uh, sets of nucleotides, they are called genetic code because each of them code for a particular amino acid of a protein. So uh, this codon dictionary helps us to understand which particular codon is responsible for which particular amino acids. This concept, this flow of information occurs from DNA to RNA to protein. This is called central dogma. These things are required for our basic understanding of this typical topic, CRISPR-Cas9. So let me just define first what is what you are going to discuss in this, uh, what, what we are going to explore in this uh, talk. CRISPR-Cas9, what is it? In, in, in its present form, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is basically an RNA-guided endonuclease, uh, an enzyme that can cleave nucleic acids from, from inside. Endo, endo means from within the, within the DNA. 
uh, and it has got the capacity to ident identify its target DNA and introduce very, very specific, very precise curves on the desired position in the DNA. So this is the, uh, this is the RNA uh, that we are talking about, the single guide RNA. So you need a guide RNA, and this is a protein that is called Cas protein, and it is going to find its uh, target DNA. This is the double-stranded DNA where it will introduce a double strand break, and you are going to a magical result after that. So how did we reach to this uh, CRISPR-Cas9 magic tool? Uh, actually, this CRISPR element is present in the in the bacterial system. It is in the bacterial chromosome. This CRISPR it comes from this bacterial uh, the full form of that is uh, it's a jugglery term. It's the full form is clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. So it's a big. Uh, I mean, uh, the abbreviation is CRISPR. So if you uh, try to analyze the issue of the word, you have get, you get some meaning. Short. You understand what is short and repeat. This is very easy to understand. These are repeated sequences of DNA. Palindromic means they read, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in forward and backward direction. If you read a particular sequence, uh, and if it is same in forward and backward direction, we call it a palindrome. Suppose from five prime, three prime, you take the sequence T T C C T N N G G G T G A A. The other strand will also have. 5 prime T, 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 C4, N2, G4, A2, 3 prime, like that. So this is a palindromic sequence, and these kind of sequences are present uh, many times in a repeated fashion. And But each of the repeats, there, there are spacer elements, spacer DNA in between them, interspaced. These uh, palindromic repeats are interspaced with, uh, with DNA elements. That's why this, uh, they're, and, and they're very, very regularly this in the interspaced DNA is also of a more or less uh, uh, specific uh, size. So this is the regular, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeat that is clustered at a position in the bacterial chromosome. And this is called CRISPR. And there is an associated gene, which is called CRISPR associated CAS, C for CRISPR, as for associated. This gene is present in association to this cluster. Uh, uh, region of the chromosome. That's why it is called CAS. So this is what is CRISPR-Cas system is. To understand it further, we need to understand what, how did we reach from this CRISPR to this CRISPR, uh, the RNA-guided molecule. For that, we need to understand a little bit the history, historical development of this particular topic. So if you go back, uh, it, it was uh, First, in 1987, that the first evidence of this uh, this kind of a repeated DNA uh, in bacteria was observed uh, in Escherichia coli, in fact. And they were not working with this CRISPR at that time. It was nothing known about this. Uh, 1987 was too early. In 1977 only, the first DNA sequencing technology was developed by Sangers and also Max and Gilbert, 76, 77, that time. Only 10 years have gone and people, people have uh, probably sequenced many genes, not, not, not that many genes, few genes, maybe. And this gene, IAP, alkaline phosphatase isozyme gene, at the three prime uh, untranslated region of this gene, they were getting a repeated sequence similar to the CRISPR. And they have mentioned in that paper, the Ishino group, that uh, this is a particular kind of a sequence that, that we are getting. We don't know what is the function of this uh, this particular repeated element in the DNA. Then again, in 1993, in in an archaea, in an archaeobacteria, that you know, these are extremophiles. This archaeobacteria, Helopharax mediterranei, this also had a similar kind of uh, repeated DNA element in its uh, chromosome. Then it was a period of a uh, genome sequence in 1992 to 2002, and it is continuing now that. There are whole genome sequences. The sir was mentioning that he has also done a whole genome sequence. So that this, this was an era when the whole genome sequencing started in 1992-2000, that period. A lot of bacteria were sequenced. Human genome project were also going on. Drosophila genome project were also going on. And there are a lot of plants, rice genome project, uh, Arabidopsis genome project, Xenorebacus elegans genome projects. All those projects started in, during 1990s. And, uh, Sequences were available, and when these sequences were compared on the, uh, uh, on the with the database, uh, 
it was found that 40% of all bacteria and almost all archaea have this kind of sequence repeats in their in the chromosome in their genome but what this is doing in the genome it was not known to scientists and everybody was surprised that such a sequence is uh, it uh, it is universally present in so many different uh, archaea and i don't know why 60% bacteria are lacking this this is a question which is hovering in my mind also uh, but all of the archaea why do they contain this repeated sequence it was jensen in 2002 who first uh, uh, who got this uh, cas sequence associated with this crispr element and he named he coined the term crispr for the first time in 2002 and then even then it was not clear what is the function of this gene in 2005 three back to back papers uh, of by three different groups by mojica group by bolotin group and fausel group they could uh, they published three papers on different organisms different bacteria uh, one of them was yersinia pestis by fausel group they could uh, say that the, the interspaced dna in between the repeated elements as are of foreign origin they are not of bacterial origin they are coming from somewhere else they are they have a sequence similarity to phages bacteriophages and plasmids so here from the concept uh, arrived, uh, arose that probably this crispr is is a kind of a mem uh, immunological memory it is a kind of adaptive immunity that bacteria are uh, uh, have stored within them with the help of this the, these spacer elements the bacteria these spacer elements are are of foreign origin they belong to certain phages which have once infected the particular bacteria and they have saved that snippet of dna within their chromosome so that they can recognize whenever the same phage attacks the same bacteria and they can nullify that that phage so that was the concept uh, growing up in the minds of the scientists and they were getting similar kind of evidences in various research it was 2006 only uh, when doudna jennifer doudna a very uh, prominent very uh, i mean uh, uh, very enthusiastic scientists you can say which has uh, which ha who had uh, uh, dreams in her mind that i had to do something but she was actu actually a worker of rna interference field doubtna got introduced to this area of crispr cas9 research but uh, she was brought, brought to this area by one of the geomicrobiologists in ukla university of california berkeley where doubtna was, was uh, appointed that year only Jill Banfield was searching for an RNA ex I expert, and she found that someone Doudna is there in in her own institution, and she and she called her uh, over phone and and discussed about this CRISPR and told her that you do do you know about this thing CRISPR Cas9? Uh, Doudna never heard about this CRISPR, and she heard for the first time. And they in this uh, coffee house they were discussing and they chopped out a collaboration that. Uh, if you collaborate to to uh, learn about this crispr cas uh, it will pay something in, in in future if you want to know more about this you can go for this book a crack in in creation written by doudna and tainberg so in 2007 uh, the crispr system was used for the first time not for the gene editing purpose but since it was known that it is a uh, Uh, CRISPR is an adaptive immunity that is providing uh, immunity to the bacterial cell, and uh, this was a, a, a private group, a Domisco, a Danish group, which were uh, they, they usually produce uh, yogurt and curd. That yogurt production requires a bacterium called Streptococcus thermophilus. It is a, a fermentating bacteria, and it's, uh, it's, it's very important. But the yogurt products got, got uh, affected by phage infection at that time. so they had to find some solution to the phage infection so what they did uh, they cultured the streptococcus uh, thermophilus with the phage uh, and, and then they plated just to find some phage resistant clones over there when they plated they got some resistant clones out of uh, the those many bacteria out of 10 to the power 9 they got some 10 or 12 such clones which which they picked up they, uh, they converted it to pure culture and when they sequenced the dna the dna of this pure culture and this pure culture there was a difference uh, from the earlier sequence to the new sequence they got that the cluster area has been has increased a little bit 
a new piece of dna has been inserted in the new new uh, the mutant organism that they are getting out of this so what is this this bacterium has picked up a small piece of dna from this patch so that's why when it was matched with the sequence of the patch they got that this sequence is matching with the patch dna sequence that means they here they could prove that okay patches are incorporating their dna they are not incorporating rather it it should better it will be better to say that the bacteria as uh, are taking up uh, a piece of their dna and they are saving their, that dna in their genome so that they can recognize these phages uh, in in future just like our uh, you can uh, imagine just like the covid 19 virus you are going through all this uh, these things uh, you are you are being vaccinated now it is why because our immune system is also capable of memorizing uh, previous infections so if you introduce the vaccine vaccine is what the antigen if you are introducing the antigen in your body and you are uh, asking your body to remember this antigen so that uh, it will prepare the the instruments the tools those are called lymphocytes b lymphocytes and t lymphocytes those are in, in a different way and whenever that same antigen in the form of the real virus enters into your body those lymphocytes will prepare the arsenals the antibodies and the t cell receptors to fight against those uh, freshly coming viruses if it is same so here was the it was it was proved that yeah this is this thing is true the uh, immunity of bacterial immunity goes like this against the phages and this was the first application they got a new strain which was resistant to phage and this problem was removed but at this point of time lot of question remains to be answered that how the phage dna snippet gets uh, incorporated in the bacterial genome how the crispr dna is transcribed and processed into small pieces of hairpin looped rna and how is the target dna recognized and is destroyed all these questions were not answered even though it was known that it is going it is being a uh, uh, adaptive immunity of bacterial system so and finally how to apply this knowledge to human use this was the biggest question hovering in the mind of doubt na especially so the collaboration of doubt now with jill as well as with uh, one more scientist uh, uh, john van der roost uh, resulted into two back to back publications in 2009 and 2010 uh, and there they could uh, uh, isolate these three genes the three proteins rather cas1 cas6 and cas3 uh, which they uh, deciphered that it works like this this is the crispr element in the bacterial chromosome this is the bacterium and this is the phage that has infected first at the stage 1 what happens the cas1 enzyme it it uh, pieces uh, it cuts the dna into small pieces and a, a small snippet of the dna is inserted as a spacer this is called proto spacer it is in, inserted as a spacer into the this clustered crispr area and this uh, virus is now uh, has been remembered in the form of this interspacer dna element in the next stage what happens the a, a pre crispr rna a long rna molecule is being synthesized of the whole crispr sequence and that is being clipped into small pieces by the cas6 enzyme like this and this area one of them one of them as you know it is the whole crispr area one of the molecule will be uh, will be complementary to the target dna the viral dna so whenever the viral dna a viral the same virus attacks the bacteria it releases the uh, its dna inside the cell and the cas3 enzyme it comes and it binds binds with this uh, this molecule this rna molecule and it clips the incoming target dna into pieces this is how this immunity is achieved but the problem with the doubtness uh, findings were that, that this cas3 is associated with uh, about 10 to 12 extra protein part of molecules so it is it was a complex kind of a structure which was actually disturbing doubtness that how can we use this complex molecule uh, for maybe gene targeting or for identifying viruses or some other human use direct application was difficult with such kind of complex structures so it was a uh, emmanuel charpentier who was working uh, far away in, in in france in the similar field with yet another bacterium uh, called streptococcus pyogenes streptococcus pyogenes is a pathogenic it's a human pathogen it's caused uh, uh, it's, it's called 
flesh eating bacteria it's a very dangerous bacterium with which she was she and her group was working and they had published a paper in this uh, prestigious journal of nature in 2011 and she got a little bit different uh, findings that uh, along with the crispr rna and, and the cas enzyme there is yet another piece of rna piece of sequence of dna that produces an rna that is called trans crispr rna that is also required for the process of uh, Uh, this uh, uh, adaptive immunity or this interference you can call so what happens is what they they found that uh, this piece of rest of the part were similar the only difference was this that the the enzymes required for this uh, process uh, was the cleavage process was simple it was a single protein called cas9 rather than cas3 and multiple multi subunit proteinase structure it was simply a single protein structure called cas9 till then charpentier's group was not able to purify cas9 she knew that there is a csn1 gene over here that is producing an enzyme and that enzyme is causing this uh, degradation of uh, phag dna that is entering into the cell and trans crispr rna has to uh, hybridize with the crispr rna first with the pre crispr rna first and that is chewed up into pieces up to that this was quite similar except that this trans crispr rna is an extra molecule that is required that was work found by this this uh, emmanuel charpentier's group so uh, what was next in 2011 uh, fortunately doudna and charpentier they they met each other in a conference at puerto rico and they went into a collaboration that let's uh, work together and find out what what this csn1 gene is producing what is the nature of that protein doudna's lab was expert of uh, uh, protein isolation protein structure determination biochemistry etc and emmanuel's lab was purely uh, on on microbiological work uh, uh, microbiological expertise was there in in her lab so what doudna and and her group particularly martin gene is uh, her her post doctoral fellow what they did they they found they isolated this cas9 um, uh, enzyme they characterized it and finally they they fused this trans crispr rna with the crispr rna and converted it into a single guide rna to make it as simple as that that you require a single guide rna and this cas9 protein to target your dna and what is interesting is this that this 20 nucleotide guide rna this position which will bind with the protospacer dna you can program this this area you can use your own desired sequence of nucleotide ribonucleotide over here and it will go and bind with the target sequence and it will introduce a double strand break so what after double strand break is introduced see how it is how this dna or rna molecules are inserted into the cell you can directly insert the guide rna along with the cas9 by microporesis uh, uh, micro injection or electroporesis or you can uh, insert that with the help of plasmid dna extra chromosomal plasmid dna that will contain those genes the single guide rna uh, gene as well as the cas9 gene so they will express in the cell and they will then uh, make this complex single guide rna cas9 complex and will target the particular dna with which this blue area the programmable uh, area of the rna uh, hybridizes with so uh, either of the uh, strategies you can use this is uh, if when you are using this one the rna is less stable in the cell so you have to study very quickly and this one is a stable system so when you introduce this and what happens a double strand break is created and the cell wants to repair that break so when the cell wants to repair it introduces uh, mutations either it deletes certain uh, some nucleotides at that position or it inserts some nucleotides at that position or it substitutes it substitutes uh, some of the nucleotides like a to t a t to g c like that so these kind of mutations are always causing uh, uh, will create a knockout mutant or null mutant of that organism that organism will not be able to produce the gene from this particular area because that is a mutant version or that particular target dna can be converted can be corrected if there is some certain error like uh, different there are different diseases in human beings which are because of the uh, sequence errors so you can rectify those errors if you introduce a donor dna as a homologous dna so homologous direct repair system will repair the, the double strand break like that this is called non homologous end joining this is called homology directed repair system so either of this system will be used 
to uh, to uh, get the, get your result done so now i am going to talk about the application part okay desirable characters for applications that we need to feed the growing ever growing population are faster growth higher yield disease resistance stress tolerance and alteration in the taste texture and nutrition value of of the crops but the conventional methods that are available are selection hybridization heterosis mutation breeding and others they take a, they are very very i mean they are there but there there are some problems with that they are slow and time consuming the uh, the problem of linkage is there that means when you are trying to introduce one character the other character automatically uh, enters into the into the target organism into the crop lack of purity and termination of sudden sudden drop in the yield termination or sudden drop in the yield uh, also occurs suddenly you are getting a high yielding variety in the next generation you might get a low yielding variety out of that because of the variability or uh, termination problems modern methods of transgenesis uh, developed in uh, in the last uh, decade in the uh, sorry last decades of the last century in fact there already 40 decades have passed when this transgenesis is going on parallelly it, it is also a time consuming in transgenesis what you have to do you have to isolate your dna from one organism then you have to clone it into a certain vector then you have to transfer it to your your target organism so it is little bit uh, longer there are many steps in that but in case of gene editing you are directly modifying your target organism this uh, the isolating genes from other organism is not required for this purpose so it is less time consuming and it is uh, the homogeneous uh, 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 horizontal gene transfer problem is also avoided and environmental issues uh, are also less important when you are directly modifying a certain gene transfer horizontal gene transfer problem is uh, is removed that's why the environmental issue is also getting less significance so some success stories regarding this we i will go very uh, fast in this area uh, this was done the mutation in fad gene in soybean to improve oil quality this was the uh, some users of gene targeting i'm talking about this protection and use in this case fad fad is a gene fatty acid desaturase that converts oleic acid into linoleic acid linoleic acid is harmful it is pro inflammatory and thrombogenic so if you mutate this gene oleic acid will not be converted into linoleic acid and you will get more amount of oleic acid in your in your seed uh, and that is beneficial so this was the uh, first mutation i will not say first there are many i have chosen only only a few as an example this is low gluten wheat uh, uh, can can it be removed this uh, low low gluten wheat removal of anti micro anti metabolites this was the Uh, next thing that you can uh, concentrate low gluten is required gluten is a problem in some uh, individuals particularly in western countries uh, uh, a, a disease called celiac disease uh, celiac disease is caused because of the gluten gluten is made up of two proteins two polypeptides one is called gliadin another is called glutenin so scientists modified this gliadin protein this alpha gliadin you can see this is the control lane and these two are mutant lanes where this alpha gliadin is absent and they proved this also by this uh, mass spectroscopy multitop rather and you can see the interesting thing is this in in, in gene editing what happens uh, this is the wild type organism and this is the mutant organism this is wild type this is mutant this is wild type this is mutant you cannot distinguish by morphologically uh, the wild type from the mutant this is so specific that the gene that you want to uh, to disturb or to disrupt you simply disturb that so linkage problem is not there and the removal of toxin in, in cassava cassava contains uh, a toxin a glycogen uh, cyanogenic glycoside and because of a certain gene and that gene was uh, mutated by crispr cas9 this uh, cyanogenic glycoside is very significant in amount and if you consume it regularly with low protein diet uh, it develops into a disease called konso disease and it's a common disease in african countries so by converting this to the low uh, toxin cassava was an important uh, uh, development in uh, by this crispr cas using this crispr cas technology this is a uh, blast resistant uh, sorry blight resistant rice mm -hmm. that was developed by this uh, crispr cas9 system as you know the bacteria the gentlemanus oryzae and other bacteria what they do they deliver a protein called tail uh this is a uh, transcription activator like uh, element which goes and binds with genes uh, in the plant cell 
uh, and those genes are overexpressed for the uh, uh, and overexpressed and the product of those genes are beneficial for the bacterial growth this is where this is how bacteria overtake the you utilize the uh, the host cell for their own growth so scient what scientists did they modified a gene called sweet gene uh, sweet gene is required for the transport of glucose uh, sucrose from the from the cells to the so from the source cell to the sink cell sweet is for sucrose will eventually be exported transporter sweet stands for that so what uh, scientists did they they modified they mutated the sweet gene by using crispr cas9 so that less amount of uh, sucrose will be available for the bacteria to grow in the extracellular spaces so with this four examples and this list uh, Uh, there are a lot of uh, the, in in case of rice the number of target genes that have been modified using this crispr cas9 system some of them use uh, uh, non uh, uh, sorry uh, uh, some of them use non homologous end joining methods some of them use the uh, uh, homologous repair method by that method they have modified several different genes in 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 rice plants and uh, in india also you you see several different labs are uh, engaged in crispr cas9 research i am not going in details in each of them but uh, a few of them like a bose institute is also doing development developing an optimized toolkit for inducible genome editing and regulation of gene expression in tomato plant uh, icar iari icgb so there are many different labs that are engaged in this kind of uh, crispr cas9 research i will not uh, lend in my talk it is already uh, delayed 3 minutes and uh, over so thank you very much for your